morning from Central Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, in downtown Lexington, Kentucky. Welcome as we worship this morning on this third Sunday of Easter. We are indeed a great cloud of witnesses, those of us that worship in person here in our historic sanctuary, others of you throughout this city in Fayette County, across Kentucky, indeed friends and family of our church who I know watch us online and worship with us from east to west across this country, Florida through Arizona, even Olivia Griffin all the way over in Amman, Jordan, who worships with us online every Sunday. We gather together to worship our God, the creator of earth, sky, and sea. Let us join our voices in praise. Please join me in the call to worship. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We give thanks and praise for God's gift of creation. God made earth, sky, and sea. God made all living things, all creatures great and small. And God calls us to care for all creation. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. I'm David Shirey, Senior Minister of Central Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Lexington, and I welcome you as we gather for our worship on this morning. I'm joined this morning by nine others, our way of honoring the request that uh, we meet in groups no greater than ten and maintaining uh, the social distancing that is required during these days of the coronavirus. Joining me this morning in 
leading worship are my director of music, Michael Rintema, and our choir of Catherine Olson and Ruthie Sangster, Andrew Durham, William Mason Walker, Grant Holcomb, and Jenny Shirey. I'm delighted that thanks to the wonder of technology, Reverend Elizabeth King and Colin Pilkington will be joining us. But in person with me this morning is my sister in Christ, the Reverend Carol Devine. She is Green Chalice Minister for our Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, in the United States and Canada. We're beginning this morning a month-long series focused on creation care in commemoration of last Wednesday's 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And there are none better to have with us to kick off this series than Carol. It's my delight that she is with us this morning to launch this series with her preaching and proclamation of God's Word. Our office remains closed in these days, but we remain as a staff available to you by email or by voicemail at the office. We also will continue to keep you updated through our Friday news, through our Facebook page, our website, our May chimes, our printed chimes, and as well as our digital edition is being prepared as I speak and should be arriving to you in your email box or your mailbox later this week. With thanksgiving, I now turn to my colleague and minister, Reverend Elizabeth King, who is back from her maternity leave and prepared now to lead us in prayer from the safety of her home. As I've come back into active ministry this week, David has been filling me in on the concerns that you've shared with him. And so this morning, as we come to our time of prayer, I lift up for you Pam and Scott Bridges and Pam's mother as they grieve the death of Pam's father this week. Pam, we hold you in prayer and extend our sympathy to you. We also remember Gary Canella, one of our awesome security staff members, whose beloved partner, Ruth, is nearing the end of her life. So Gary, we hold you in prayer as you sit vigil with her from a distance. We also remember Bud Hall and Pam Hammonds who are hospitalized and their spouses, Sarah and Gary, who have to accompany them from a distance. And we remember this morning, Brad and Pam Beck as Brad begins chemotherapy. We continue to hold in prayer, Sarah Hyden and Lainey Sidebottom as they recuperate from COVID-19 at home. Sarah is doing well and we celebrate that. Lainey is continuing to experience symptoms. So we hold you in prayer, Lainey, praying that those symptoms will be relieved. We remember Nancy Lawrence this morning as she prepares to make a transition and move to Richmond to live with her daughter. Nancy, we will miss you when you make that move. And we hold in prayer beyond our church community, our extended church family, Coralie Gallucci's husband, Mike, as he has some ongoing health concerns, and Cindy Miner's daughter-in-law, Nicole, who is home recovering from surgery, but also preparing for another surgery. As we share in our communal prayer in this season of Easter, I hold all of you who have been struggling with health or grief, or fear, or loneliness, in the light of our hope in Christ. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of the wilderness, God of our dark days, God of the crucified, God of all mystery and waiting, and God of resurrection and redemption, we yearn to know your presence and feel your spirit leading, for we are an aching world. We persist in conflict over culture, religion, and land. Disease and disparity of resources have long plagued your children. Our earth has been groaning with our overuse of its resources, abundant though they are. 
Wind and storms take homes and lives and livelihoods from rich and poor alike. We receive life-threatening diagnoses and deal with falls and wounds, all while doing the daily grind of balancing work and family and relationship. We were an aching people before COVID-19 came to our nation, our states, our communities, and our churches and homes. And we come before you now from our separate places, many of us feeling scattered, unrooted, and as if nothing is certain. The struggles within our lives, relationship difficulties, health concerns, emotional strains, mental health, and other challenges all feel intensified as we seek a rhythm for our lives and seek support for our concerns during a time of pandemic. We have been awaiting the promise of new life and you have come. We turn to you in praise for your son has risen from the dead and he is Lord. From wilderness to resurrection, you have led us through Lent and into Eastertide. Trusting you will lead us always, we pray, redeem the wilderness in which we live. As we long for connection, we seek you so that we might ground ourselves in the hope you promise. Help us to open our hearts and our eyes to see the reflections of the resurrected Christ in our midst. For you call us to see the resurrected one in our daily walk. May we see you in the messages, calls, or cards we might have received from those saying hello or asking us how we're doing. May we see you in the sweetness of a baby's coos and in the smell of dinner cooking and the efforts of the ones who provided it. May we see you in the bread dropped in our mailbox by a friend and in the rain that may darken the sky but brings life to the earth and its creatures. Redeem us from our unwillingness to see hope or experience you. Cast aside all that stands in the way of our acceptance of the life you offer us. Allay our needless worries and our founded fears. And help us to rest and trust that Christ is risen and our redemption is sure and certain. So that we might become like the women who first found the tomb empty. So that we might become proclaimers of the truth of your resurrection and ours. Give us voices to speak gratitude and praise and the courage to love fiercely in all times. Guide us that we might embrace the promise of new life and live in ways that nurture your creation in times of wilderness and dark days, in the places of oppression and death, in the times of mystery and waiting. Make yourself known to us, O oh God, and make us into your people of resurrection. These things we pray in the name of the one who is resurrected, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, howdy partners. I don't quite know who you're looking for, but I don't know no Colin Pilkington. It's just me, some random cowboy, going for a walk on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Did I fool ya? You know, we don't always recognize the people we see on the street. It doesn't help when they're wearing a cowboy hat and wearing a bandana. In today's Bible story, people don't recognize Jesus either. A man named Cleopas and his friend, who is not named in the Bible, are walking from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus, where they're from. And they're both really sad that Jesus has just died. This happens right on Easter, or right after Easter. And so they're walking, and all of a sudden a man comes up with them and asks them, you know, what's wrong? You look kind of sad. What they don't realize is that the man they're talking to is actually Jesus. Well, they tell them, gee, Jesus has just died. You know, he was this great and awesome person. We, we were kind of hoping he was, he was God's, you know, chosen son. And the stranger, who is Jesus, who they don't recognize, starts telling them all about what the prophets have to say and what everything leading up to Jesus' death actually means. And they invite the stranger in, and as they're having dinner, Jesus breaks bread, and instantly his friends recognize him again, and they're so excited. And then he disappears. And they rush back to Jerusalem to tell all of the disciples that they had seen Jesus. And they were super excited, because they had finally been able to recognize just who Jesus was. I hope you're all having an absolutely fantastic day, and go enjoy a nice walk outside, and hopefully you'll see someone you know. Bye, guys. Today's reading comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but I have been walking a lot lately. 
Every day, in fact. There is something about taking a walk that calms us. I've taken a lot of walks in my life with friends and family and alone. But these last few weeks, my walks have become necessary in order to have peace. Now, when I encounter someone else as I'm walking, I cross to the street in order to keep social distancing, and I have not been walking with any strangers. But I did encounter a little boy, about four years old, I think, who was overflowing with joy as he held a kite in his hands. He told me from a safe distance that he was going to the park with his grandma to fly the kite. Sebastian communicated with his whole being. Sebastian was so delightful that now every time I take a walk, I look to see if I might see him. I have developed new relationships with many trees as I walk. I connect with them each day and have watched them go from no leaves to full foliage, from tiny closed buds to bursting with pink, purple, and white flowers. There are also a lot of squirrels and dogs and cats that I look for as I walk. The walk in our story today takes place on that same day, which was the first day of the week when, as Luke tells us, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them had gone to the tomb. They did not find a body, but two angels. They went back and told the disciples, who thought it was an idle tale, and did not believe them. Now, some Bible manuscripts end there with that unbelief, but others add that Peter ran, ran to the tomb and saw the linens and went home amazed. Our story takes place on that same day. Two disciples, Cleopas and his wife, Gloria, were walking the seven miles from Jerusalem home from Emmaus. Now, as Colin just told you, the Bible does not tell us that it was Cleopas' wife, Gloria. It could have been someone else, maybe his partner, maybe a friend, but obviously they lived together, and since women often go unnamed in the Bible, and I am a woman, it makes sense to me that it was his wife, who I've named Gloria, because Cleopas means glory to God. So, Cleopas and Gloria were walking and talking about all that had taken place When Jesus came near them, they were not having to social distance at that time. So he walked with them and talked with them and explained Bible stories to them. And it was amazing. And they did not want him to go. So they invited him to stay with them. So while Gloria put the soup on to warm, Cleopas set out some bread and olive oil and maybe some fruit and cheese and some wine. And even though it had been a long, emotional day and they must have been tired from traveling, they did not want this day to end. I have felt that way, haven't you? The first time I traveled to Ecuador about 30 years ago, I found myself at a dinner party with a lot of people I did not know, all speaking Spanish. And I met a woman named Lorena, in whom I recognized something very special, as we also ate soup and broke bread and maybe had a little wine. We talked until late, and I did not want that night to end. Similarly, at the beginning of this past February, before the pandemic was here in the U.S., I traveled to North Carolina to lead a climate ambassador training with a group of disciples, clergy women. There was a beautiful young woman who joined us, who's a clergy person and works with the Poor People's Campaign, and her name is Erica. 
After a full day of training, we went out for pizza together and I sat with her. I recognized something very special in her as she told us some of the stories of her life and I did not want that dinner to end. We all have those kinds of holy encounters where we've met people who bless us, who change us, who show us God while sharing a walk or a conversation or a meal. Those feelings of connection bring us a peace that passes all understanding. You know, scientists today are proving through their research that those feelings of connectedness come from literal physical connectedness. Science is proving what ancient mystics and holy scripture have told us for thousands of years, that we are all connected. We are all related. That my DNA is 99.9% the same as Lorena and Erica, who are Ecuadorian and African American. They come from vastly different families of ancestors than my Irish European family of ancestors. And yet, we share 99.9% of the same DNA. We all do with every other person, with Cleopas, Gloria, and Jesus, with people who live on the other side of the planet, even with people we do not like. We're all related. We're all connected. And get this, y'all. Our human DNA is way more alike than different from creatures, great and small, and also trees and plants, including wheat and grapes. We contain the elements of stardust and we're about as salty as the ocean. We are related and connected to everyone and everything all the time. Yep, there's science proving that you and I already knew there's a DNA connection, y'all, with the one who created and all that is created. There's a DNA connection, y'all, between the creator and creation, between God and stars, between God and us, between God and trees. Through microscopes and telescopes, we now know that the pattern of neurons, protons, and atoms is similar to the pattern of planets, stars, and galaxies, and that they are all connected and relational to everything else. And science tells us that the energy of the universe is not in the planets or protons themselves, but in their relationship. Not in the things, but in the space between them, in their connections. In our brains, for example, the power is not in the neurons, but in the connection between the neurons, in the relationship, if you will. The foundational nature of reality is relational. Everything is connected and in relationship to everything else. As you all know, Genesis tells us at the very beginning, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void while darkness covered the face of the deep. And a wind from God, the spirit of God, the very breath of God, swept over the face of the waters. The word is ruach, which can be translated as wind and spirit and breath. So God's very essence is where it all began and how it all came into being. It is the stuff of God, the DNA of God that gave us life and connects us to each other and to everything else God created. 
And scripture tells us that we were created in God's image. Genesis 1.26 reads, God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Now some Christians read that as Trinity and some do not. Our Jewish brothers and sisters also contemplate this mystery, but it is certain that us and our is plural, and that plural is relational. So we were created out of relationship to be in relationship. If we could see our connections, we would see a complex, intricate web of lines coming from each of us, connecting us to each other and to all creatures, all plants, all microbes in the dirt and stars in the heavens. As science continues to affirm this connectedness through astronomy, neurology, biology, oceanography, and physics, we all say, yep. We've known that all along. Because even if we haven't understood it, we have known it in our hearts as our hearts have burned within us, as we have felt those connections in our spirit. Like some years ago, as I was taking another walk, but this time on a beach, And I had to stop because I came to the place where the river connected to the sea and I could go no further. So I stood to watch the setting sun. And as I stood there, I started to see a lot of movement in the river water. And suddenly, all at once, as if choreographed, five dolphins threw themselves up out of the water and onto the shore, landing right at my feet. I had just witnessed what is called stranding. What happens is at low tide, the dolphins work together, swimming in a circle, pushing all the fish closer and closer together, and then all at once, facing in the same direction, They jump out of the water and land on the beach, making a mighty wave full of fish that they immediately snap up. Relationship. Those dolphins were all in relationship with each other. And to the water and to the rhythm of the tide, which includes the moon, and to the fish, and from that moment on to me, Because my heart burned with the holiness of that moment and I recognized God in it all. Holland is the word. Holland is something that is a whole and a part at the same time. Each part contains and mirrors the whole. Lorena and Erica and Sebastian contain and mirror God. And so do the trees And the dolphins, we are all individuals and we are all connected to each other and to God at the same time. Holland, a relational God, exploded in the beginning, sending DNA out through God's very breath, creating everything while also connecting everything. We are all related and interdependent. And as the African philosophy of Umbutu says, I am because you are. I am because we are. And this pandemic has definitely illustrated that to us, right? We are completely dependent on each other and creation for our physical needs of food and shelter and medical care and also for our emotional needs of connection and peace. This pandemic that we are living through is hard stuff. And yet there are blessings and beauty and growth that are also occurring. We are being reminded, for instance, that what we do or don't do directly impacts others. If I unknowingly come in contact with the coronavirus, 
I can spread it to others, to family, to friends, and strangers, even if I don't have symptoms. Also, the forced shutdown of activity has cleared the pollution so much that in China, they can now see mountains that are not normally visible. And the water in Venice, Italy, is clearer than any person alive can remember. The quiet and reduced activity has had very positive effects on wild animals of all sorts. We are all connected. And we were created to be that way. But we have lived our lives forgetting that or ignoring that to the point that 50% of all the trees that used to be here are gone, and 80% of our rainforests have been destroyed. Our forgetting or ignoring those connections has resulted in the extinction of thousands of species of plants and animals and has resulted in 100-year floods and raging fires that devour our actions and our non-actions have resulted in the last decade being the hottest in 800,000 years and this past winter the hottest on record. We have not recognized God in each other We have not recognized our connections, our relationship, or our responsibility for each other and for God's good creation. This week, I read what the founders of Earth Day wrote 50 years ago, and I realized those exact same words still speak truth. But now, we are living the climate crisis We are no longer warning that if we don't do certain things, it will happen. It is happening. We are now living in a climate that has never before been experienced. We do not have a manual that tells us or guides us what this is going to look like or feel like. But according to climate scientists, we have now less than 10 years to drastically change how we live on this planet before we pass into global catastrophe. This pandemic provides us a window into what that global catastrophe could look like and feel like. And the response to the pandemic also shows us that we can make drastic changes to how we live in a very short amount of time and that our leaders are willing to throw a lot of money at problems and that scientists are important partners in solving those problems. Here's the thing. The amount of released carbon into the atmosphere continues to increase each year. We have not yet leveled off. We have not yet begun to flatten the curve in today's language. The superstorms, droughts, and flooding that we are experiencing in these days was actually caused by carbon that was released decades ago. The carbon that we are releasing now will be felt in the future. And just like a boiling pot of water takes a long time to cool down, the Earth's temperature will not drop as soon as we begin to flatten our carbon curve. And this is hard to wrap our hearts around. I was interviewed by a religion journalist last fall who ended our interview by asking me if I think we can save humanity. And I could tell by her voice that she was no longer just asking for the article she was writing. She was asking for herself. Yes, I said, I know we can. Because we have the power of God in us. The power is not in me or you or anyone else, but in our connectedness, in our relationship. It is Holland. And as people of God, we are the best ones to lead on climate because we understand that we have been called to difficult work, to do justice, 
the fruit of which we won't necessarily enjoy. And people of faith and disciples congregations like Central Christian Church are leading the way. Central has reduced energy use by over 30% in these last 10 years through geothermal heating and energy efficient windows and occupancy sensors, LED lighting, and more. There are creation care tips shared, hikes taken, youth mission eco trips, and children and adult education. We are drinking fair trade coffee here at Central and not out of styrofoam cups. We see the connections. We feel the love. We know our relatedness and our responsibility. We are part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world, and we recognize that those fragments are sacred, Holland. Many and one, reflections of God who have incredible power through connectedness and in relationship. So let us recognize God in bread, in trees, in dolphins, and in each other. We are in this together. And the people say, Amen. Amen. from others that it's challenging to stay connected right now. Not only connected to one another, but connected to God. The rituals that made us feel sure of God's presence with us have been disrupted. 
our worship together, even our times of meditation or Bible study at home have been upset by our work from home, school from home, even visit from home schedules. Our worship together in person has become worship apart and our table, the one table around which we gather, has taken on the shape of many tables, yours and mine, in our homes. Our scripture today offers hope that God is present around these many tables in our homes. The disciples on their way to Emmaus encounter Jesus, but they do not recognize that it's him until they invite him into their home and he breaks bread. We gather around our many tables this morning, inviting God's presence into our homes, and we break bread so that we might encounter, remember, and recognize Christ with us. Let us pray. God of life, we give thanks and praise to you for the resurrection you offer us in the risen Christ. Bless the bread that we partake today, whatever kind of bread it is, that it would cause us to remember and to lean into your love, a love that is shown to us in the death and resurrection of Jesus, a love that is shown to us in his teachings and ministry, a love that lives on in the spirit and will not fail us. We remember you also as we partake of your cup, a cup of covenant and promise, a cup of grace, we pray that your grace would encompass us and that you would help us in your love to extend grace to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples to share a meal. And as part of that meal, he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus poured a cup. And blessing it said, This is the new covenant poured out in my blood. Do this also in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim Christ's life, death, and resurrection until he comes. Let us pray. Have mercy on us, life giver and sustainer, and in our remembrance of this meal, Nourish us that we might experience your resurrection until we gather again to break bread. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank each of you for your exemplary stewardship during these past weeks of our being apart from one another. We haven't worshipped together since March the 8th, and that was the Sunday the power went out, and we had to worship in Fellowship Hall. But your giving over these past weeks has sustained our ministry, and the support that you have shown by your online giving and your mailing in your gifts has been nothing short of extraordinary. I thank you. Thank, as, thank you as well to our choir for the music that they have offered each and every Sunday. Thank you, Carol, for the offering of that exquisite word. My goodness. A shout out to our teachers and Sunday school classes for the offering that you are making every Sunday morning during the 930 hour now of Zoom Sunday School. You all that are watching online, you don't have to be in Lexington to be part of any of our Sunday school classes. If you desire to be a part of those classes, our Friday news will provide you instructions on how to do that or lacking 
access to that, just call the church office and we'll help you get connected with any of our Sunday school classes, as well as our Wednesday afternoon 515 prayer group, Cultivating Mindfulness. I know that Lisa Moss and company would welcome you there as well. And a shout out with special thanksgiving to one of our newest members, Jane Knapp, who produced, thanks to her seamstress skills, several dozen face masks that she made out of cloth in various colors and styles and gave them to God's pantry for distribution to our volunteers and our clients. I want you to know that along with food staples, every single one of those masks was taken with gratitude this past week for all of these offerings and now for the offering that our choir makes with their anthem, Look at the World.
Almighty God, we know that your word will not return empty. And so we trust that all of our offerings, all the gifts we share, and every blessing will accomplish the purposes for which you desire them, that we might honor you and serve others through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn on this third Sunday of Easter, for the fruit of all creation. Now may the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and yours. Go forth to love and serve the Lord and care for all of God's creation. Amen.